evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the launch of the African Center for the Study of the United States right here at the University of Pretoria. My name is Alma Akarp, and I'm humbled to be your program director today for this special occasion. Please allow me, on behalf of myself, on behalf of AXIS, and on behalf of everyone else who will speak up here today to acknowledge our guests. We have the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawana Kupe, the Prof Maharaj, the Acting Vice Principal for Research, Innovation, and Postgraduate Studies, Prof Vasi Reddy, the Dean of the Humanities Faculty, Prof Christopher Isike, the Director of Access UP, and Dr. Bob Wekesa, Acting Director of Access Vits, our esteemed keynote speakers who will be introduced in greater detail at a later stage. Charged Affairs of the U.S. Embassy in Pretoria, Heather Merritt, and all represented from the Embassy, all ambassadors and members of the Presidency who are here physically and joining us virtually, members of the UP Executive, deans and deputy deans of all faculties, HODs, and all UP staff, ladies and gentlemen, both here physically and virtually, good evening. You are all honored guests and we are honored to have you here with us today as we launch a center that will contribute to bridge the knowledge deficit for Africa in its relations with the United States. In the United States, there are currently over 40 institutions across um, universities that study Africa. So far, here in Africa, there are only two research think, think tanks dedicated to comprehensively studying the US. One is in Morocco, one at the University of Witwatersrand, and the, today we launched the birth of Axis UP. It is significant, and although it will be a second center in South Africa and only the third in Africa, it is primed to be the launch pad for other similar centers across African universities through its pan-Africanist, trans-university, and transdisciplinary outlook. Well, that, with that being said, rather, I'd like to invite Prof. Vasi Reddy, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, to introduce our first speaker for the evening. Please join me welcoming him. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, for those introductory remarks. I must say um, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here and to say a few words to introduce our first speaker. Of course, I speak on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities as the Dean, and we're delighted to be the incubating inaugural host of this phenomenal uh, important initiative, the African Center for the Study of the United States. Of course, we see the center with major expectations. We're aspirational in so many ways and, and uh, ambitious at that with the center. Of course, we'll hear more about it in a minute, but the more important thing is that we view the center as a potential important premier and creative hub, if you want, for a better word, of African knowledge in the field of studies uh, of the United States, which is not just simply a geopolitics, but it's also an idea, an object of inquiry, and how fitting to see that linkage between the US and our very vast and diverse continent and geopolitics of Africa. We'll hear more about the prospective areas of alignment when we hear other speakers. But as I said, as a dean, I'm really excited about this initiative, and we'll hear instrumental ideas coming forward. But perhaps my job here is more importantly to introduce the vice chancellor and principal whose brainchild this has been. And I think that's the important issue, the conceptualization of this center, not just simply as an academic center, but as an idea that is involved or evolving rather. Professor Cooper, I'm sure, needs very little introduction, so I'm simply abbreviating for those of you who may not know who he is. He joined the University of Pretoria on the 14th of January, 2019. He brings a wealth of teaching, leadership, research, and certainly, very importantly, public intellectual contributions, not just simply to the country, but globally. Trained in Zimbabwe and Norway, he's also a professor of media studies and the founding head of media studies at the University of the Witwatersrand. And I'm sure we at UP and many elsewhere are witness to the energy, 
drive, dedication, and commitment that Prof. Uh, Cooper brings to the academic project. Beyond these accomplishments, very important to note that Prof. Cooper's significant contributions also lie in building academic partnerships across the continent, if not the globe, and for the leadership, transformational at that, in higher education at a global level. Significant also is his efforts in fundraising and bringing partnerships together. More recently, he was elected as the chairperson for Africa in the Australia Africa Universities Network. I could say a little more, but let's invite Prof. Coupe to say a few words and address us on this important brainchild that now has a significant UP chapter. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Reddy, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, I'd like to recognize over and above my executive colleagues, Prof. Temba Mosia here and, <clears throat> and Prof. Nicholson, the faculty registrar, that I have a fellow vice chancellor in the house, the vice chancellor from the University of Cameroon. That's correct, yeah, please say thank you uh, very much. And the vice chancellor from the University of Cameroon happens to be the father of our MC tonight. <laughs> yeah. Thank you uh, and welcome to, to on this occasion. Uh, many of my colleagues, as we know, uh, this is take two for me. This uh, idea of this kind of center started uh, at my, in my life at the University of the Witwatersrand, otherwise known as Witz University. So this is a repeat occasion. The idea also was my attempt to run away from executive life and retire as the director of that center. But the idea was uh, not that the center will be at Fitz University owned, that as many universities as possible will have such a center on the African continent. It, in a sense, to complement and, and partner the very idea that in the United States, there are many centers for African studies. And uh, thanks to, the, to our colleagues at the American Embassy then and now, and the State Department in the US, I was put on a visitor's leadership program to visit such centers all over the United States. And also I spent three hours at the State Department. But uh, often many of my friends ask me, why have you always insisted on having a center for the study of the US instead of a study of the center for a center for the study of the UK, which was a colo main colonizer in this part of the world. I said, that is actually not interesting. <laughs> but that's not a complete and honest answer. Perhaps the complete and honest answer is that when I was in grade nine, one of my teachers noticed that I like reading a lot. And they brought me, for the first time, my first copy of Time magazine. Some of you have known Time magazine is an iconic magazine in the US. So from grade nine until now, I've always read Time magazine, and it was a fascinating story of American society, the American nation, and its history. It is also true that the first flight I ever took out of the African continent to go anywhere was to go to the United States, to California, specifically to San Bernardino County, and I'd never flown out of the continent before. I'd taken domestic flights in my own country, but never flown outside the country. Um, because of what I had read in Time magazine, I believed I knew America. So I did very dramatic and perhaps dangerous things. So <laughs> when I arrived in New York, it turned out that I had a 10-hour layover. And I remembered that I had read about Fifth Avenue. I didn't have enough money to buy anything in Fifth Avenue. I said, no, well, really, I had an American visa. So I asked around and I discovered, and I knew that there were yellow caps. So I got out of the airport, took a yellow cape to Fifth Avenue on my own. Spent hours there wandering around and checking out and saying, I can't afford this, I can't afford this, I can't afford this. So I went back to the airport, <laughs> made another dramatic mistake. I went to an, uh, no, I was thinking like an African. So I saw an African flight attendant. That was an African American. I said, oh, that's our sister, so if I go talk to her, I can do I said, um, my flight is in the next three or four hours. Can't you put me on an earlier flight? It helped. She said, yes, I can. But she made a mistake also. She overbooked the flight. 
So when I got to my seat, someone was already sitting there. Now what do I do? So I turned around and looked at a flight attendant. Flight attendant said, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry, come with me. I thought she was going to eject me out of the plane, so I got back to the plane. Remember, I had never flown outside the country. We traveled, in, we walked in the plane for a long time, and we reached this, a place that looked like this place, except the seats were far apart. It was not business class, it was first class. But there was a difference. Everybody in first class was dressed like my colleague here. And I was wearing dirty jeans, I was very young then, a bachelor and a young lecturer. I don't think those jeans had been washed for two weeks. <laughs> Even the jersey I was wearing, I don't remember when I last washed it, dirty turkeys. And I looked around and everybody was in an Armani suit. I don't think my hair was combed either. I had flown overnight from London. So, but I sat down and this woman came and said, can I have your sweater, say? Aye, because underneath was a lecturer's t-shirt. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I'm fine. And she was holding a very expensive coat here. I was like, the coat here was more expensive than the sweater. I'm like, no, can't do this. And I looked around, people were in Amani suits. <laughs> and so she went away. She came back to her, can I save you anything? I looked around and said, you know, if you're a young bachelor, you get a hold of a fork, you just eat like this. No, you don't really do it properly. No, I'm full. Well, anyway, I must, stop, I must stop there and get to my speech. But that is why we have the Center for the United States. I lived there in California for a few months <laughs> looking for a place to do my PhD studies. I got the place in the U.S. in Northwestern University. But the Norwegians came around, and Vikings will be Vikings. They took me on a ship to Norway. Good evening, and may I add a very warm welcome to all our dignitaries and guests present here on this very auspicious occasion. As we officially launch the Investor of Pretoria's African Center for the Study of the United States, UP. Let me add, I always did this when I was at WITS, is the study of the United States as a nation and as a society. And I think this is very, very important and what uh, my colleague here alluded to. We're not studying the US just as a geographic location, if you like, or a geopolitical entity as a nation and as, as a society. And this will be important when we begin to, to study that. Thank you to those who have traveled from both far and near to be here physically. It's a great privilege to welcome you to the Javed UP Art Center, which is one of our new, our, one of our new major transdisciplinary platforms. And how fitting that we are launching Access UP, another strategic transdisciplinary platform here today. Just to explain that transdisciplinary in the context of UP means that when we study the United States, it won't be just from a humanities perspective. It will be from the perspectives of multiple different faculties. So in a sense, what makes American science tick and work and what are its dynamics? And, and, and how have Americans dealt with science? And how do they do science? So it will be many disciplines will be paid to bear on our study of the United States. And to those who are joining us virtually, a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world and where you are sitting right now. Although when you are talking about people doing things virtually, you should add where you are lying right now because people do these things in bed. One of the silver linings of the COVID-19 pandemic must certainly be how it has accelerated the notion of the global village, a community in which distance and isolation has been dramatically reduced. While as nations we are more accessible to each other than ever before, we still have much to learn about one another. With our new proximity driving the need even further to understand our, to understand our respective historical, social, political, economic, and cultural development. This is one of the contexts, this is one of the contexts of our gathering here this evening to formally launch annual African Center for the Study of the United States at the University of Pretoria, which will be a transdisciplinary and thought leadership platform for a coordinating knowledge-driven engagement between Africa and the United States. And here, I don't, uh, you, some people say to me, but you want an engagement between a continent, because Africa is not a country, it's 54 countries, and one country. I say, yeah, 
in, in, in academia, that is what you can actually do. You can seek to, att to attempt to compare apples and oranges, and you can come at it with a very interesting angle. This is the second center as per the original design, that as many African universities as possible should have such a center, which I personally will be involved in after the one I founded at Wits University. The University of Illinois, by a renowned, um, <clears throat> By a renowned anthropologist, Mervil Herkovitz, he's the first person who studied in an African Studies Center in the, in, the, uh, 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 in the United States. I think I, uh, I jumped a particular sentence here which I wanted to make. As I said, I did my pre launch speech in February on why it is important for African universities to study the US. Top universities around the world have research centers and think tanks dedicated to the interdisciplinary a multidisciplinary study of other countries' origins, which is worthwhile, not only for knowledge's sake, but also because it is extremely helpful, for example, in formulating domestic and foreign policies to further the national interests of their states. Let me add, our, this center is not going to be restricted to studying the foreign policies on It is but one area in which we'll study. In this way, these universities not only justify their mandates as citizens of learning, but also as influencers of global politics and international relations in general. In the United States, there are over 40 institutions across universities in the country that study Africa. And I visited about perhaps by now about half or so of those. And these days to 1948, as I said, when the professor at Northwestern University the anthropologist Mervil Hefkovic started one. The African continent, on the other hand, has not scratched the surface of studying the US, which has numerous political, military, and commercial interests in Africa, or placed in no more common language. is generally considered one of the superpowers of the world. That concept also is very elusive these days, that in that it originates from the Cold War, if you like. There are now a few more other countries that might aspire to the status of a superpower, China being one, uh, I shall not mention the one that is uh, controversially involved in certain activities these days, uh, that we will study too, including, including Africa's own cultural connections to it. And this is very, very important. When one thinks of the United States, one must not think only of the political economic relations. One must also think about the people-to-people -people relationships, including individual relationships. So when I was constructing the center at WITS, one of the things that the State Department uh, arranged for me was to meet with organizations of people that had supported the South African liberation struggle. But some of those were not people from organizations, it turned out. They turned out to be individuals who were lone rangers in their own right. Some of them turned out to be musicians who, in a sense, were inf their music was influenced by South African music and vice versa. Often those nuances of the relationships are often, uh, if you like, lost. We will be studying those as well. We do need to turn what my colleagues in film and, and television studies call the critical gaze on the US to complement its own critical gaze and understandings of Africa with Africa's own understandings of the US and Africa in its multiplicity as different countries. And that is why we must have as many centers as possible. It is in the light of the resulting disadvantaged position within which the continent engages with the US that more research think tanks dedicated to studying the US comprehensively are needed in Africa. This disadvantage, of course, is an opportunity, and that is what we're doing at the University of Pretoria. Turn the disadvantage into an opportunity for new institutions. Access UP is the second such center, as you have heard. There's also one in Morocco. Although Access UP is a unique value proposition, which will make us different, and this director, Professor Isike, shall speak to this in a bit, we're extremely excited by the opportunity it presents to complement the work of our colleagues at WITS and the work of our colleagues at the American University, at the International University, sorry, in Rabat, Morocco. And to be a launchpad for other similar centers, as I've said uh, too many times now, uh, through its pan-Africanist, cross-institutional and transdisciplinary outlook. 
We have high expectations in terms of our access UP. We'll contribute to us bringing the knowledge deficit, which is an opportunity for East Africa in its relations, engagements, including people to people engagements with the United States. This is extremely important given the current global configurations. In particular, the much touted power shift from West to East and Africa's growing role and importance in these processes and long-term trends. We must remember here, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about Africa, a continent of 54, 55 countries with the youngest population, a growing population projected to be about a third of the world population by 2100, about uh, 1.3 billion people. This will become a continent of increasing and major significance in the world, which ought to engage from a, pro, uh, from a position of critical knowledge of other regions, societies, and nations in the world. At Investor Pretoria, we are passionate about our continent's potential to thrive as a knowledge economy that relies on itself for solutions to its own challenges. I believe that universities need to be at the forefront of devising solutions and they need to be strongly and visible experienced as key drivers and collaborative agents of change. In this regard, the center will partner with lots of American universities or for people who are interested in America and also of a further understanding of Africa. In my, in my first take on this at WITS, there's no American university I didn't meet and I met 30 to 40 were not interested in a partnership on this. I was particularly struck by the investor of Virginia, who sent a large delegation after hearing of the center to talk about how we could do comparative history of America's history, especially if you think where the investor of Virginia is with his Confederate history and South Africa's history and so on. The emergence of transdisciplinary approaches, local and global, has presented the opportunity for higher education institutions to take a lead in creating new knowledge and new ways of doing things. And this process of holistically rethinking and repositioning our, our university and this role in broader society is one in which Investor of Pretoria has embarked on a few years ago, partly prodded by uh, the, the traumatic and, and the dramatic development of COVID. Built on this, we recently released our strategic plan to creatively reimagine the university over the next five years by, among us other things, transforming teaching and learning and research and engendering a resilient, sustainable, future-focused university with revitalized partnerships and collaborations locally across the continent and globally. So, Access UP is aligned to UP strategic plan and key transdisciplinary platforms, such as the Future Africa Institute and Campus, Javet Where We Are, Engineering 4.0, Innovation Africa at UP, and the Center of, of the Future of Work, which we launched a few hours ago in this very building upstairs, all of which foster a collaborative research culture across the university community worldwide and help create a critical mass of researchers for new knowledge generation. We are grateful that we already have strong partnerships with several universities and institutions in the US. We look forward to extending this access UP, access UP and to promote scholarly research and interfaculty exchanges for staff and students, for policy engagement. Our research, we intend, will also be trained into policy briefs and a material for policy engagement with the US business interactions and cultural context between African and American universities and epistemic communities in areas of mutual interest and benefit. So Access UP, and I won't uh, list everything here, is we intend to cover the range of issues from agriculture to zoology and everything in between. The taste, the interest, the take of researchers and students is what is going to drive our research agenda, if you like. I must add that given its geographic position in the city with the second highest number of embassies after Washington, D.C., the University of Pretoria is well placed to convene and foster Africa-U.S. engagements. And, and, and in this space, what we intend to do also is, given there's a large African diplomatic community here, to start, if you like, African, an African diplomatic academy 
based on a program we already have in the political science studies and the faculty of humanities. To conclude, Africa urgently needs good leaders in every sector who have foresight and wisdom and are well-educated and well-skilled, rounded citizens who understand local and global challenges. You cannot do so without such think tanks. Part of this is the need for Africans to turn a critical, analytical African focus on a nation and a society that is a major world power. Not just using Cold War lenses and, and perspectives. Africa has often been too hostage to how America sees the world or how the former Soviet bloc or China see the world. We need African eyes to see the world. And the truth is somewhere between, is, is within our own eyes informed by understanding other eyes. The launch of Access UP is thus a prominent milestone for our university, our country and our continent, and we look forward to great outcomes. Having said all this, I hereby launch the African Center for the Study of the United States at the University of Pretoria on this day, 17th day of March, 2022. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Coupe. We should have had a ribbon and a scissor, I suppose, as well, but, uh, but, but uh, indeed, and we, we get the drift. Uh, thank you very much for highlighting at both a personal, uh, political, and also intellectual level, you know, some of the, the broader remit of, of such a center in, in the way you've envisioned it, and, and also alluding to the research agenda that is at stake. And I have the privilege to introduce the uh, Acting Vice Principal Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Education, uh, who assumed this position, Professor Miraj, uh, who will say a few words uh, addressing some of these issues that we've talked about. Um, and it's interesting, a media studies professor, and we have uh, coming forward an engineer, an academic professional engineer at that, who's been at UP for a number of years, electrical, electronic and computer engineering, and he was also the, uh, prior to the current position, the uh, dean of the faculty, one of the largest faculties at the university. Um, and more importantly, he has also been appointed since late last year as the first African dean to the Global Engineering Dean Council as chair. And I think that's quite a, an important accomplishment. His area of work, and he's published quite extensively, is um, largely in uh, broadband wireless communications with a focus on 5G cognitive radio sensor network resource allocations, all big words, but they impact all of us as we speak. Wireless channel uh, modeling and edge commu computing communication systems. Very important uh, domain in terms of technology and certainly innovation. And if, if not at the global level, at the local level, he is also the chair of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. And on home territory here at the University of Pretoria, one of our other important platforms, chair of the Tux Innovation NPC Board, which is a very important high-tech uh, business incubator and accelerator. So I'm curious, as I'm sure our big a broad audience to listen to you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Miraj, uh, uh, from your perspective, as what what a pr pr prospective research agenda might be. Over to you. Our program director, our vice chancellor and principal, Professor Coupe, our uh, Ms. Heather Merritt from the U.S. Embassy, our UP executives here this evening, our deans, um, senior management, our keynote speakers, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, both present here today and online. So, Prof. Reddy, I'm not going to speak about engineering. I don't think that's the topic today. Uh, so, my brief that was given is talk a little bit about our transdisciplinary research um, and how it fits into this African Center for the Study of the United States. I think um, the University of Pretoria has strongly signaled our intention to be a leading research intensive university, and in our view, embracing and strengthening a transdisciplinary research platform, and a key to achieving this aspiration. So establishing this and launching this center today, which the Vice Chancellor has done, is just a step in our pursuit on this agenda. The USA, and as a Vice Chancellor also mentioned, arguably as a global superpower, 
and the world's largest economy, we understand that the United States of America has far-reaching influence in Africa and the rest of the world, whether we choose to admit it or not. We in South Africa and at UP also recognize this, and this will be the case for some time to come, irrespective of power shifts that may occur in the future, also as the VC alluded to. So this influence is multifaceted and multidimensional, ranging across political, economical, social, technological, legal, and environmental domains. While we speak about these domains in distinct terms, we know that they are interconnected, they are interrelated, with complex interplay between different domains. For example, and without any specific reference to the United States, for example, with the COVID-19 pandemic, political, economic, and legal positions of different countries of regional blocs had significant influences on their access to technology and to the care of our population in Africa and the most vulnerable in our society. This is the landscape we exist in an example of the complexities we must navigate both locally and globally. By adopting this wide angle view, we have set the foundation for a transdisciplinary approach for study and research of the US to learn about the US as a nation and a society as a means of also learning about ourselves as South Africans and Africans and how we can benefit in a symbiotic way. And that's very important for us. It must be symbiotic through such research and engagements. Within this approach, we draw on functional and disciplined experts from each domain to explore and create new knowledge in their focused areas, as well as to have them around the table for complex issues that cross disciplinary domains. Such, rich, such richness of voices, perspective and talents can only contribute positively to our holistic approach, understanding and sense-making provide a greater meaning and relevant translation to our heterogeneous Africa context for sustainability. By adopting a transdisciplinary approach, we embrace diversity, inclusivity, and collaboration. We anticipate participation from across our university community, other universities in South Africa and Africa, and including the US, of course, governments and diplomatic corps, international bodies, industry, and civil society. Thus, the research we will conduct be relevant and responsive to the needs, interests, and issues across different groups of stakeholders. It is important that this is also done through African lenses and experiences, answering the so what question, and moving beyond creating knowledge for its own sake to creating knowledge to solve common problems so that we can address the challenges of unemployment, poverty, and inequality, especially in our country. We also see research and education as two sides of the same coin, each virtuously feeding off each other. With transdisciplinarity in both research and education, the African Center for the Study of US at UP will strengthen knowledge and build capacity in interactions and cooperation between Africa and the US. Such capability will include molding the T-shaped professional with a strong technical foundation in this important field of study and complemented with a broader set of skills for leadership, engagement, and of course, influence. It shall also include looking inwards and supporting multidisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, research between the different faculties and disciplines at the University of Pretoria to produce relevant research that solves real problems at all levels of society, including the social, economic, and technological. By implication, Access UP is a platform and call for transdisciplinary research to solve problems beyond our university walls. This transdisciplinarity will also extend beyond the University of Pretoria to develop linkages between us and universities in the US and Africa that will, for example, and just one possibility, see a three-way collaboration between, for example, being an engineer, I'll talk about engineering, for example, technical and engineering faculties in South Africa, Africa, and our American counterparts. As the VC mentioned, our transdisciplinary focus will span a number of faculties and disciplinary areas, including, for example, public health, science, innovation, information technology, biosecurity, agricultural economics, 
sustainable food systems, food security, which is very important to us, and of course, critical accounting, governance, and thought leadership. Our transdisciplinary research will be futuristic in outlook, considering dynamic changes, new developments, and trends as the US evolves, as do its interactions and impact with South Africa and the world. This will form the basis of the knowledge-based advisory services to inform strategic and constructive decision-making and interactions between Africa and the US. Our four key transdisciplinary platforms at UP, for example, the one we are today at uh, Javid UP Art Center, the Future Africa uh, Research Platform, our Engineering 4.0 facility, and of course our Innovation Africa at UP will all play a catalyst role in actualizing the vision and mission of Access UP in line with the strategic reimagination and repositioning of the University of Pretoria. This focused for societal impact in sustainability, teaching and learning, training and research. Today we launched the Center for the Future of Work as a transdisciplinary center which we see integrating into access for if we cannot empower adequately, equip our graduates, and of course develop skills and re-educate those employees for the future world of work in the corporate space, then I think we have failed our mandate as a university. All together, we are excited and optimistic for this new transdisciplinary and thought leadership platform for knowledge-driven engagement between the US and our continent and South Africa in particular. Some of the key attributes for the future world is embracing change, emotional intelligence, diversity, cultural intelligence, exercising good judgment and decision making. As we know, these are important attributes for the graduates of the future. And these are things we need to manifest besides others, of course. And we will see this as access playing a pivotal role here. We believe it will be a powerful vehicle for transdisciplinarity and for research that matters. In this way, it will make a real difference to our ongoing and mutually beneficial interactions in a respectful, dignified, and sustainable matter, manner for the people's lives that the University of Pretoria touches every day. As we say, make today matter. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Dr. Bob Wekesa. I'm sure he's around. Thank you very much. Now, my task here is simply to talk about our value proposition or comparative advantage, as some of us prefer to frame this in academic terms instead of you know, business terms such as you know, value proposition. However, as things evolve, it is important to balance the you know, public good essence of education with the sustainability imperative, especially in the context of resource challenges that we face in uh, context like Africa. So, so, so let me go with both. So I will talk about our value proposition uh, or our comparative uh, advantage. Now, a critical question to, to, to frame our value add and, and, and comparative advantage is how access UP will be different from the American Language Center, for example, access VET, and similar centers that will help to establish in other African universities uh, in the future. Let me tell you uh, something uh, the, vice, the Vice Chancellor said that made me do a quick calculation. He had said that Axos, when he started the idea of Axos at VET, he wanted it to be a place where he would retire to. And then when he said that, I did a quick calculation, and then I remember that he still has seven years to be Vice Chancellor at uh, UP. And from there, typical UP tra tra tradition, he will become Vice Chancellor at New Zealand. So um, I'm not holding the position in, you know, <laughs> for him. I, I, maybe if my wife permits me, Dr. Isike, if she permits me to keep working in another three years, who knows where I'll be, so no problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. My slide up, yes. Yeah. So I'm just gonna talk about one thing. Our value add or uh, our comparative advantage. Now, a critical question to frame our value add or comparative advantage is how Access UP will be different from the American Language Center, like I said, um, or Access uh, at VETS. Um, as illustrated in the slide, a logic uh, model progression from our approach in terms of how we tend to see what we are going to do to the activities that will emanate from that and our projected impact it all underscores a virtuous cycle to increase value. So our approach entails a comprehensive and multidimensional study of the United States, as the Vice Chancellor said, beyond the narrow scope of its politics. Now this sets, up, uh, sets us up for the multi uh, and, and transdisciplinary work that we envisage we'll be doing. Beyond gathering and generating um, you know, knowledge for its sake, um, we shall broadly make sense of some of uh, sense of the U.S. in different African contexts, ensuring relevance to our particular context at UP and South Africa. Our approach is further differentiated through le leveraging our connectivity advantage, such as our unique location, which the Vice Chancellor you know, uh, uh, talked about, as a city with the second highest number of diplomatic missions in the world after Washington, D.C., our wide-ranging network relationships with relevant supranational institutions in Africa and the U.S., and our, of course, our existing transdisciplinary competencies and platforms, which both the Vice Chancellor and Professor Maharaj referenced, um, uh, 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 such as, for instance, the Javet UP Art Center, where we are currently, uh, our Future Africa Campus, Engineering 4.0, and others. Now, in terms of uh, Access UP in action, our differentiated approach, which I've just talked about, informs our strategic goals, the work we will do, and our deliverables. These include relevant transdisciplinary research. We're talking about quality education on the US nation and society, as the Vice Chancellor said, in Africa, that is integrated across our curriculum, specialized training for developing capabilities for African diplomatic practitioners, as well as US diplomats in South Africa. And believe me when I say we do have something to teach the Americans. Believe me when I say that. And we do have, and we're gonna do that because we believe that as we co-create knowledge um, together, we will learn things about ourselves and that we informed at the and improved uh, quality in our relationship. We believe these shall in turn drive impact on our visibility and positioning as the premier Africa, uh, African knowledge creation hub, like the Dean said, in the field of studies of the United States. Overall, our engagement in research that matters shall ensure responsiveness to the lived realities and needs of Africa and Africans with relevance for the US, as I mentioned, as well because it will be relevant to American scholars. The knowledge we produce will be relevant to policymakers in America and civil society groups in the US uh, in ways that will also positively shape their policies towards Africa. 
this benefits the U.S. as well because if Africa is developing, if Africa is, is happy, the United States as a world leader would also be happy. Now, in terms of impact, finally, our dynamic landscape monitoring and sensing will further enable a futuristic and predictive outlook for access UP. We will be able to produce Africanist and Pan-Africanist knowledge-based advisory services and policy briefs to African government and the African Union, our regional economic communities, and the Pan-African Parliament that will inform a continent-wide Africa-US policy. Notice I didn't say US-Africa policy, I said Africa-US policy. We believe that through our differentiation future, such as a sense-making of, of US studies from African lenses, Axos UP will produce a prototype of how Africa should engage with global powers in future, irrespective of their shifts or of influence across the landscape. Amitav Acharya will talk just now about the multiplex world as the world we are going into. I believe that even when that happens, the United States of America will still be a relevant power. So it's very important, it's very useful for us to begin to understand this power that is going to be here with us for a very long time to come. I'd like to close now by thanking Professor uh, Tawana Kupi, the originator of the Axos UP idea, both at VET and at UP, for his ever active support. Um, this is the Vice Chancellor that walks the talk. <laughs> we'll go straight now, ladies and gentlemen, to our uh, special guest speakers for this evening. Um, I would introduce them and then um, we would have them speak. Um, we have a recorded um, um, speech or talk that has been given to us by uh, Professor Amitav Acharya um, from uh, American University in Washington. Um, I would introduce him and then we'll play that recording. And thereafter, I will come back again to introduce Professor Toyin Falola. Uh, probably I should introduce Professor Toyin Falola and then uh, just after Amitav will play the recording and then uh, introduce Falola before taking my seat so that after that we'll have our last speaker who is here present with us, I'll introduce her and then she can do a talk. So in terms of introduction, Professor Amitav Acharya is the UNESCO Chair in Transnational Challenges and Governance and a distinguished professor at the School of International Service, American um, University in Washington, D.C. He is the first non-Western scholar to be elected as the president of the International Studies Association, the largest and most influential global network on international studies. Previously, he was a, he was a, a professor at York University in Toronto and University of Bristol in the UK. He is currently honorary professor at Rhodes University, South Africa, and guest professor at Naikai University in China. He was the inaugural Boeing Company Chair in International Relations at the Swazam Swazman Scholars Program in Tsinghua in University. Uh, he's a fellow of Harvard Asia Center and John F. Kennedy School of Government, as well as the Christensen Fellow at Oxford. Some of his books include Reimagining um, International Relations, World Orders in the Thought and Practice of Indian, Chinese, and Islamic Civilizations that he did with Barry Buzan, The, ma the Making of, of Global International Relations, with Barry Buzan again, and then Constructing Global Order. Another one he did in 2014, and the second edition in 2018 was The End of American World Order, and Whose Ideas Matter. Um, Professor Acharya has appeared on mainstream news media, such as CNN International, BBC uh, TV, and BBC World, news, World Service Radio. He has received two Distinguished Scholar Awards from the International Studies Association for his contribution to non-Western international relations theory and inclusion, uh, and also another as a scholar of exceptional merit whose influence, intellectual works, and mentorship will likely continue to impact the field for years to come. In 2020, he received American University's highest honor, Scholar Teacher of the Year Award. Um, that is Professor Amitabh Acharya. He's going to be talking to us uh, for 10 minutes. He's been recorded. so. Load shedding or no load shedding, we will hear him. Um, and then uh, I will just quickly introduce Professor Falula, um, who has uh, modestly said that we say as little as possible. He is a professor of history 
um, a university distinguished teaching professor, and he's the Jacob and Frances Sanga Mosika Chair in Humanities at the University of Texas at Austin. He has served as the General Secretary of the Historical Society of Nigeria, the President of the African Studies Association, Vice President of UNESCO Slave Route Project, and the Club Chair of the Countries of the South, Library of Congress. He's a member of the Scholars Council at the Club Center, the Library of Congress, like I said. He has received over 30 Lifetime Career Awards and 16 Honorary Doctorates. I will say that again, 16 Honorary Doctorates. He has written extensively on African knowledge systems, including religious beliefs and knowledge systems in Africa, African spirituality, politics and knowledge systems, sacred words and holy realm, and decolonizing African studies, knowledge production agency, and voice. He is also the series co-editor for Cambridge University's press series on African identities. I will now take, um, allow for us to hear Professor Amitabh Acharya, after which Professor Tony Falola will follow and give us a live talk for 10 minutes. Each of these speakers will have 10 minutes uh, to speak, and then I'll come back to introduce um, our last speaker for today, uh, Ms. Lindiwe Maziboko. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amitabh Acharya, and I am a professor of international relations at American University in Washington, D.C., in the United States. I am also an honorary professor at Rhodes University in South Africa. It gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome the establishment of the African Center for the Study of the United States. Partly because a lot of the commentary about Africa that we have today are actually from African study centers that operate in the West, in the United States. But we don't have really a lot of centers or institutions that study the United States from an African vantage point. So there are a lot more African study centers in the US than United study centers in Africa. And this center really is a very timely initiative. And I hope uh, it will produce knowledge about the United States from an African uh, perspective. Now, another reason why the creation of this center is so timely is because uh, of what's happening in the world. World order is uh, changing right before our eyes. We would think about the COVID-19 pandemic, which lingers on, or the Russia-Ukraine conflict, which uh, is uh, turned out to be a uh, proxy war between uh, in the United States and Russia. And uh, also uh, longer term changes like the rise of China or uh, the re-emergence of uh, <clears throat> India. When you look at uh, the global power shift, look at the conflicts uh, such as in Ukraine, you look at uh, the transnational dangers of uh, the pandemic or the climate change. There's a lot of things happening in the world which need to be looked at carefully and from a long-term perspective and from an African perspective. So it is my hope that uh, the new center under the direction of uh, Professor Christopher Isike, a good friend of mine, and I congratulate him for his uh, wonderful initiative. I hope the new center will be uh, able to make sense of all these developments about the world order from an African perspective. Of course, uh, the focus of the center is going to be the United States of America. And when you look at the role of the United States and its leadership in the world, we also see major changes happening. Now, we have talked about, uh, there's a lot of debate about uh, the relative decline of the United States, decline of American power. Now that is uh, important, but that's not everything. 
What is actually more important is not the decline of the United States as a power, but the decline of the world order that America built after World War II. Sometimes it is called the liberal international order. And that order is uh, framed, not because of challenges from countries like China, although the West seems to blame it on with non-Western countries like China and Russia, it's actually declining from within. It is declining from leaders like Donald J. Trump, or uh, it's declining because of uh, developments within the West, like uh, the Brexit, for example, when Britain walked out of what was one of the pillars of the liberal international order, the European Union. So European Union without Britain is weakened. Uh, as a pillar of the liberal international order. So my point is that the liberal order is weakening from within and not, cannot be blamed on non-Western countries. And in that sense, in that uh, context, American leadership of the world is also changing. The United States is no longer the world's leading military power and the leading economic power at the same time, the way it was after World War II. Today, if you look at uh, the size of economy, the GDP, and especially in terms of purchasing power parity or PPP, China is a larger economy than the United States. So no longer is the world in a situation where the largest economy is also the strongest military power. There is a bifurcation of power at the heart of world order. And that also affects American leadership, the way the United States is uh, building, or the ability of the United States to build and manage world order. And uh, another important point here is also that power is not the same as leadership. Now you can be a leader without being very powerful and vice versa, you can be very powerful but not lead. So we have seen under Donald Trump, uh, the United States refused to lead. It kind of became transactionalist and uh, withdrew from uh, WHO, World Health Organization. It withdrew from uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a big trade agreement that US has itself promoted under Obama. The United States withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement. So, Leadership, American leadership shrunk during Trump administration. Now, Obama, sorry, Biden, President Biden has tried to revive it, but he is being selective about it. He's not interested in leading the world on trade, but maybe leading the world when it comes to security operations through, through NATO. So the United States is powerful, but not leading in the same way as it did before, and certainly not in every issue area. We have countries like the Scandinavian countries, like uh, uh, Canada, for example, who are not uh, very powerful in the military sense, but have provided leadership in multilateral institution building and creating global norms. So you can see that uh, there is no necessary correlation between power and leadership. In that sense, I call it a multiplex world where no single country leads in every issue area, but different countries and actors or groups can lead in different issue areas. The European Union and climate change, while well, China on international development, India in producing vaccines and, and drugs, and uh, the United States when it wants to lead on uh, military security. The, that really changes the face of leadership in the world. And this is something that has not been understood by academics and policymakers, and not just uh, in Africa, but also in the United States. And this is something that uh, I very much hope that your new center would be able to uh, focus on, the changing face and nature of leadership, who are the new leaders, what is uh, the nature of leadership? Leadership, for example, is no longer uh, about, or leadership in global governance is not just about uh, what the United Nations 
and multilateral institutions affiliated with the UN view. We now have global governance that is uh, fragmented or pluralized. So we have uh, non-state actors, private sector, corporations, foundations, civil society movements, all jumping in to do global governance. Global governance is happening at the local level. A lot of the climate action, action against climate change actually happens at the municipal level, at the state level, not at the national level. So, no, and, and the United States government, for example, when President Trump withdrew the US from Paris Agreement, many American states refused to go along. They continued to work towards the goals set by the Paris Agreement. Whether they were successful or not is a different thing, but at least there was a commitment. So if you bring this all together, we are in a very interesting period of transformation in world order. And it is vital that African scholars and policymakers should have their voice, their ideas and approaches to be recognized and uh, heard all over the world, including the United States. This is why I think this center is very timely, has a very important role to play in contributing not only to the intellectual life of uh, the University of Pretoria or South Africa, but for the entire African continent and beyond. So I wish you very well, every success. I hope I will be there in person one day soon to give a lecture like this in person. But in the meantime, good luck and be successful. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And I've been teaching a class of United States and Africa for 20 years. In addition, when you have a free moment, check what I call USA Africa Dialogue, which has been in existence for a very long time, covered of the interests that this center is about to generate. Each posting on that dialogue reaches a minimum of 1 million people. And it's about bringing Africans in diaspora in conversation with Africans and taking US issues to Africa and African issues to the US. It's, you know, some years ago, um, when folks like Marcus Garvey were trying to talk about back to Africa movement, they gave a new name to Africa, United States of Africa. So we will have ended up with two USA, United States of America and United States of Africa. And the reason for this is a deeper historical relationship between the continent and the country. And I work out the long history of this relationship in a book with the title United States and Africa, published by Yale University Press. And when we trace this historically, we see connections through slavery, the Atlantic slave trade. We see connections through the missionary activities. We see the linkages between Liberia, Sierra Leone, and United States so deep if you have been to Liberia, you will see names that are American names like Monrovia, so many examples. You see political connections like Pan-Africanism spearheaded by great minds and intellectuals like W.E.B. Du Bois. And during the colonial and post-colonial, immediate post-colonial phase, the most Popular Africa is the United States, by far the most popular country. Why? It did not get involved in the colonization of Africa. And after the Second World War, it also pushed the collapse of the European empire. Throughout the colonial period, 
if you are if you're looking for higher education your best place to go is united states and in contemporary times it becomes one of the greatest magnets uh, of migration Second clusters in chicago baltimore atlanta houston dallas in houston today there's what we call little lagos with so many African businesses and markets, long chains, more stores, and many things. There's little Ghana in Los Angeles, and there's little Senegal in Harlem, uh, in the United States. We're mapping out all these clusters. I'm doing a book on them as well. We must underscore this relevance historically. Both continents and the country have needed one another. The US during the Cold War, as it was mentioned, tried to be involved in terms of reacting to communism, issues around terrorism after September 11 has brought deeper military and intelligence contacts connecting to homeland defense and related issues, economic dimensions, available raw materials, the region from Central Africa to where you are, South Africa, is a geological anomaly with over 40% of global resources, many of what the United States is looking for, including oil, business interest, connection study abroad program. On the turn of Africa, they want expanded trade, they want to attract investments. They want protection for agriculture. Uh, and these politics, these issues are key. Today, the, the question we pose at the African Union, the question we pose in African universities is what is the contribution of people like me based in Austin to Africa? We begin to see how Africans are contributing to the development of the U.S. historically. And your center has to highlight this in terms of, and we have to highlight the contributions Africans make, Africans based in the U.S., they make. We are studying remittances. The revenue of Gambia that it generates on its own is between $200 and $250 million a year. The remittances is 600 million a year, the buck coming from the US. So your job is cut out for you in terms of what we have to study. The urgent areas of interest include the study of migrations, transnationalism. What does it mean if you have many African citizens abroad with two homes? And we must salute the African Union for saying that Africans in diaspora now constitute the sixth region. Even there is an endorsement by the African Union for this center. In other words, the older division of women abroad is being dissolved so that your center will play a crucial in studying migrations and its consequences transnationalism and its consequences, geopolitics, the role of China, new competition that we have to we have to map out. Let me congratulate you on the relevance of this center in terms of exchanges, exchanges of ideas, exchanges of students, in terms of research partnerships. And I'm, I'm very happy that you've added sciences to it with humanity how those research partnership will benefit the two places knowledge sharing what we call brain drain we now refer to it as brain circulation what am i contributing to you what are you contributing to us it should not be a one-sided affair because if it becomes a one-sided affair then one person is begging. So the center must ensure that they give, they get, 
we circulate, we promote one another. Our research is key to this development. I want to end by saying that the center marks the beginning of the creation of the United States States for All. I congratulate you for this initiative. I will be in South Africa next week, and I will come to the center to give a one hour lecture on mapping the significant areas in this deep and profound historical relationship with global consequences. Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, Professor Falola. Thank you also for announcing it before I had had a chance to announce it, that he will be here on the 28th of May and we will host him in the Department of Political Sciences um, and we'll be willing to share him with um, other universities. I'll still probably look at the University of Johannesburg as well. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to tell you that Professor um, Acharya um, was meant to be here live and then COVID happened, you know what that means. Um, he will still be here, we will try and get him to come here and he has promised that he will spend a week with us at the University of Pretoria. So we, we are, I can also tell Professor Falola that diaspora diplomacy is um, one area that we'll be looking at. I was in uh, the United States for three months last year and I interviewed him about the uh, soft power value that Nigerian Americans had both for, not just for Nigeria, but also for Americans giving their dual citizenship. So it's an issue that we're interested in. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we are far behind time. Um, I would want to quickly rush. We have just two items to go, I assure you, and then we'll be done. Um, I'm hungry, I want to wet my beak, so I'm sh I assume the same for all of you. So I'll quickly introduce um, uh, next speaker who's here. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, um, Lindiwe Mazbuko is a South African public um, leader, writer, and academic fellow. She was the first black woman in South African history to be elected leader of the opposition in the parliament of South Africa. Ms. Mazibuko is also the co-founder and chief executive officer of Future Elect, a nonpartisan movement to diversify public sector leadership in Africa. A graduate of the University of Cape Town in South Africa and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in the United States, Ms. Mazibuko was an elected rep representative in South Africa's National Assembly until May 2014, when she resigned from active politics in order to return to higher education. She has served as, as fellow of the Institute for Politics at Harvard University and of the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies Theas in South Africa. She is currently a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, a Fisher Family Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, uh, School's Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs, a trustee of the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, as well as the Institute for Security Studies, and an advisory committee member at the United Kingdom Government Technology Startup, um, which is a political and apolitical group um, limited. Despite her decision to take a prolonged hiatus from public life, Ms. Mazbuku remains committed to promoting change for the better uh, uh, for the bet for the good of South Africa in for, for the better in South Africa sorry and Africa as well as the global south she firmly believes that it is possible for us to build societies across the continent that are generous towards the poor protective of children afford women and men equal status and protect human rights and enforce the rule of law while providing economic opportunities for all. Ms. Mazibuko, you're welcome to take the stage, but I use my power standing here now to say that um, you make your speech 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. I often make a joke about how politicians cannot be relied upon to adhere to time limits in order to beg the leniency of the um, program director, I do that again here tonight. Um, thank you so much, program director, uh, University of Pretoria, uh, Vice Chancellor, Prof. Tawana Kupe, um, for having me here tonight on this auspicious occasion. Uh, and congratulations on the launch of the Africa Center for the Study of the United States at UP. I'm proud to be standing here today, six months after the signing of an MOU between my organization, Future Elect, and the University of Pretoria, a partnership 
spearheaded by Prof Kupe himself, as well as by my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Stembile Mbete, who since 2018 has been working with us at Future Elect uh, in order to support and develop a new generation of ethical, accountable, and people-centered dem democratic leaders in Southern Africa and Africa. Our organization is non-profit, non-partisan, and unabashedly focused on political and government leadership. We develop emerging public leaders in Africa who want to serve the people of their countries regardless of their political and ideological affi affiliation. Our mission is to empower a new generation of ethical political and government leaders to bridge the gap that exists between political institutions in Africa and the citizens that they serve. In order to achieve this, we offer fellowship programs for young leaders, both in Southern Africa and soon in East Africa, a civic education program online, which we are in the process of developing, as well as a program for women in public office, which we hope to launch in South Africa later this year. Our three-year agreement with the University of Pretoria, which locates our work as part of the Future Africa Center, will see us and the University of Pretoria collaborate in a number of areas aimed at training and developing Africa's future government and political leaders. So I'm happy today that the intervention that I've been asked to make on the value of democracy in the governance of our continent starts by referencing a 2019 survey by the Pan-African Research Institution Afrobarometer, also recently having signed an MOU with the University of Pretoria. As you may know, Afrobarometer is a renowned research institution in Africa which conducts representative mother tongue public attitude surveys on democracy, governance, the economy and society in Africa. In 2019, it found that th in 34 countries on our continent, demand for democratic leadership significantly outstrips supply. The report is the result of an ongoing survey, which Afrobarometer co commenced in 2005, to gauge people's perceptions of whether or not their countries enjoy enough of the democracy that voters seek. Throughout this period, demand has consistently outstripped supply by anywhere between one and 15 percentage points, indicating that we very much want dem democratic governance to succeed on our continent, even though often it does not. I reference this survey and I fundamentally believe it's an important one because I believe it's taking place against a growing backdrop of, on the one hand, democratic regression throughout the world, uh, and, and on the other, a kind of a noxious narrative on our continent along the sort of lines that democracy is a Western concept that is not suited to us as Africans and uh, does not work in tandem with the notion of a homogenous so-called African culture. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to guess where such an argument comes from and whom it benefits. Autocrats would be presidents for life who want to cling to power by arguing that autonomy and self-determination are not good enough for Africans would benefit from such an argument. I fight it as enthusiastically as I fight for better democratic leadership on the continent. Afrobarometer surveys not only put paid to this insulting proposition, but the language of supply and demand in their studies also forces us to ask important questions about what we're doing to improve the supply of democratic leadership on our continent. We know from Freedom House that democracy is on the decline in Africa, exacerbated very recently by centralization and the postponement of elections in the wake of COVID-19. But we also know that there's decline elsewhere in the world, including in European and North American countries of the so-called global north. So we see two contradictory trends, increase in demand and decrease in supply. This is indicative that this narrative about democracy not being African enough or being incompatible with our culture is a top-down narrative, a narrative of elites and would-be repressive leaders rather than something that is representative of the body politic. Often lack of voter participation, especially amongst young people, is cited as a reason to advance this narrative. But again, here the data show that young people only check out of, of politics because they're unhappy with the choices that they are offered. 
not because they're disinterested in governance or that they lack an interest in self-determination. This is why they find alternative spaces that they can lead in. They start social enterprises. They engage in regular protest action, which gets more attention often. And they digitize organizing across borders, especially, for example, in the case of climate crisis uh, that we have seen around the world recently. So the time has come, in my view, that uh, leadership includes young people and empowers them to participate in the very systems that has failed them in order to make them better. Democracy cannot succeed unless the people who are supposed to be led by democracy are also part of the decision making. But make no mistake, as young people start to occupy these spaces, false narratives about their not being ready to lead or being too impetuous or irresponsible will emerge in their wake. Gatekeeping, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most powerful forces maintaining the status quo in politics today. That's why we believe fundamentally in changing leaders rather than destroying the systems which give us as Africans the autonomy to choose our governments. Uh, choices that were denied us under generations of colonialism, white nationalist government, and illegitimate interference in our right to choose. An interference which continues in many cases to this day. So yes, Africa needs democracy. Democracy is essential and failures of bad leaders shouldn't be used as justification to rob Africans of their right to self-determination. Our work is to design democratic systems that are suited to our context, that serve our people rather than rob them, that foster openness and accountability, and crucially, that enable bad leaders to be replaced by good at the ballot box. Finally, an anecdote. My alma mater in the United States, Harvard University, is home to one of the world's most illustrious centers for African studies. Recently, uh, about five years ago, they set up an outpost in Johannesburg for research purposes. Um, and it was uh, lauded at its launch less than five years ago. But if you think about the enormous opportunities for Africans to take that gaze and pass it back to the United States from our own perspective. Our perspective, for example, on Black Lives Matter and the experiences of the African diaspora in the United States. Our perspectives on matters like Roe versus Wade and a woman's right to choose. Our perspectives on jurisprudence around everything from equality to freedom of speech. Our perspectives on the culture wars, on the rise of right-wing politics, on the epidemic of gun violence, which took 10 more lives in Buffalo, New York this past week. My view is that soon, the University of Pretoria should seek to similarly establish a research center in the United States, maybe in what is Pretoria's sister city, Washington, DC, in order to conduct research and advance scholarship on the United States from an African perspective. Perspective matters, ladies and gentlemen, and Access UP has the potential to make a huge contribution not only to scholarship but also to policy making within and throughout the African continent. We look forward to being a part of this process and this exciting innovation. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Lindiwe Mazbuko. I must just say, growing up in high school, that was my role model. I started speaking because of you, and seeing you speak in front of me has me feeling all types of excitement. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to ask if Prof. Vasu can welcome, okay, I will be welcoming, rather, um, to Ms. Heather Merritt, Charge d'affaires from the U.S. Embassy, who is going to give us a message from the United States of America. Please come forward, ma'am. Oh, good, good evening, everyone. And it's, it's a huge pleasure to be here. As, as we've said, I think we've acknowledged the protocols a few times, but just to say again, it's, it's, it's wonderful and humbling to be here at the University of Pretoria. 
And thank you to the entire team here at the University of Pretoria <clears throat> and the African Center for the Study of the United States for allowing me to be a part of this very special and, and frankly humbling occasion. Across more than two decades of serving the United States as a diplomat in Africa, I've seen time and time again that there is an ever-present need for close collaboration and partnership between the United States and the 54 countries of Africa, not least of which here in South Africa. There's a need for institutions focused on bringing expertise from both sides of the Atlantic together to find answers to our shared challenges and to find the opportunities that will advance our shared prosperity. I do want to reflect for just one second on the question I think uh, Professor Coupe started us with about why, why an institute for a study of the United States. And I think we've heard a number of answers, including the really important role of the diaspora and the, the ability for this kind of study to be a mirror and to reflect back and forth and for critical voices from Africa to help improve not only our US relationships with Africa, but to improve our internal US dynamics and politics. I, I take that very seriously. But I will also note from a South African perspective, the US and South Africa had $21 billion, a record setting, $21 billion in two-way trade in 2021, despite the pandemic. And that is in fact mostly the balance in the favor of South Africa's trade with the United States. This center can help to find more opportunities for South Africa to sell its goods and services in the United States. The number one country that was the, the source of tourists coming to South Africa last year for the first time, the United States. And of course our cultural connections, our, our business connections, uh, companies like Ford have been doing business here for more than a hundred years now. The role of the churches, the role of civil society, the role of our many, many people to people ties, um, all I think speak to why this is a valuable endeavor. So when we at the embassy heard about the center launching here at the University of Pretoria, we were so excited because of the potential it has for responding to the need to bring our peoples closer together and to expand our already broad and deep and vibrant partnership. And you know, from our recently concluded Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation project here, which enhanced the university's renowned Mapungungwe archive to the role that the university plays at the heart of our US South Africa higher education network, including our university partnership initiative we couldn't be more proud of what the United States uh, mission and the University of Pretoria are already achieving together. The range of topics for the center to explore stretches well beyond the horizon and even beyond what we've discussed this evening and we're focused on now. Whether it's examining the challenges faced by democracies or addressing the multitude of issues that have come to the forefront during the pandemic, helping South African audiences and African audiences understand the United States and helping the American people better understand Africa and better understand ourselves are really ways that this center can help strengthen ties between our nations and between the nations of Africa and the states of the United States. Um, and to really help people that are half a world apart to better understand one another. And so I hope there will be space, as you've mentioned, to look at the United States through a truly interdisciplinary lens in line with this university's other incredible efforts to think globally while acting locally, such as the innovative Future Africa campus. So we really welcome the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, um, transdisciplinary approach that's been mentioned. We welcome the critical gaze that's been mentioned by other speakers. I think it will only enrich our partnership and will only enrich my nation. That's why I'm so humbled to be here for this. And so as we inaugurate the center, I just want to leave uh, this distinguished gathering with a quote from famed American poet Maya Angelou from The Pulse of Morning. And she said, the horizon leans forward, offering you a space to place new steps of change. Bridging gaps in understanding between Americans and South Africans makes those new steps of change possible. And I hope this message of courage and hope spurs the center's team onto every success. 
So congratulations on your launch, and thank you for letting the U.S. Mission be a part of your launch today. Thank you very much for those powerful words of support, but also indicating the wonderful real relationship that continues. I was asked to make a few concluding comments. I'm not. Um, I'm, I, I have a simple task, and that's basically to say thank you to everyone. Obviously, to the VC for hosting this event, to my colleague, the director of the center, for your leadership, vision, and I must add to the group, your energy since you took over this position. It's, it's fantastic to see what is happening. To, to our wonderful program director, thank you so much for holding us all together. To the young, talented team that entertained us here. And perhaps more importantly also to the Javed Arts Center for hosting us um, with this space, this wonderful space. And more importantly to the Institutional Advancement Team for the behind the scenes and on the scene work. We say thank you to all people present. We really, really appreciate it. And the volunteers, of course. But more importantly to each one of you for staying a tad longer. And with that, we invite you all to enjoy the refreshments and drinks that we have outside. Please, thank you very much. Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. A seed planted today takes root and grows into a tree that bears fruit in the future. Over 110 years ago, a seed was planted. Today, that seed, the idea of excellence, has grown into the University of Pretoria, South Africa's largest contact research-intensive university. Nine faculties and a business school are spread across seven beautiful campuses, which are home to over 50,000 students, ready to make an impact in the world beyond university and join our global network of nearly 300,000 alumni. Future-focused, sustainably developed facilities and cutting-edge multi- and transdisciplinary research are underpinned by a desire to transform lives and have a positive impact on communities and the world. Excellence in teaching, learning, research innovation, arts and culture, and sports puts us firmly amongst the world's best universities. Knowledge is not just what is in books, it is the wisdom to apply it, to nourish and nurture the seed so that it takes root, grows tall, bears fruit and branches out. UP plants that seed that tiny bit of curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, hope, the desire to care, respect, help, and innovate against all odds. To grow, to leave your mark, to excel, to challenge the norm, to think, to rethink, to discover, to inquire, to lead, to have courage, to make a difference, and to persevere. This is the University of Pretoria. We make today and every day matter.